I'm Elliot Forrest. It's Sunday, September 9th. Today on Breakfast with the Arts, music legend Paul McCartney reveals another of his talents in the North American premiere of Paul McCartney Paintings at the Arnold Feeney Gallery. Turning to another artist, it's the Breakfast with the Arts premiere of Pablo Picasso, A Primitive Soul, a profile of modern art's most influential figure. In the news, conductor Pavo Yarvi joins me to talk about his new position as music director of the Cincinnati Symphony. Plus, in our open book segment, we'll hear from authors David McCullough, and Hal Jackson. All coming up on Breakfast with the Arts. Welcome to Breakfast with the Arts. As a musician, Paul McCartney has created a monumental legacy. Of course, it began in the early 60s with the enormous success and influence of the Beatles. In the 70s, he triumphed with his band Wings. Numerous successful solo projects followed. And in the early 90s, he composed his first classical work, Liverpool Oratorio. Paul McCartney also happens to be a talented visual artist. He's drawn since his youth and turned to painting some 20 years ago. In this morning's film, Paul McCartney discusses his work and influences and leads a personal tour of an exhibit of his paintings in England. Now, the North American premiere of Paul McCartney, Paintings at the Arnold Feeney Gallery, on Breakfast with the Arts. I started painting when uh, I was 40. Somebody said life begins at 40, so I thought, well, I'd better help it along. Uh, I'd always liked the idea of doing it, but it felt like somehow it wasn't allowed for people like me who hadn't been to art college and hadn't trained. But uh, in a conversation with a uh, friend, Willem de Kooning, he uh, made me feel very free about painting and it got rid of my block so I started then be around about 1982 and um, so that was it I bought a lot of canvases and just unpaint and just started having a go thinking well what's my style gonna be I thought well I can't be a Van Gogh look-alike or a Matisse look-alike or whatever so I'll just <clears throat> just start and see if a style develops. That's what I've done. And it's now about 18 years ago that. So that would be in Arizona, that one. This one is more Long Island in America. Uh, the light's very beautiful out there. And this is round about the place where Willem de Kooning paints. And seeing as he was probably the guy who turned me on enough to allow myself to paint. Um, this is a region where I feel very good to paint, uh, conducive to painting. When I was thinking of doing an exhibition in Germany, I got asked by this man Wolfgang Suttner if I would do an exhibition in a place called Siegen. And when I was thinking what I might do, I realized that not only are my roots Celtic, having a sort of Liverpool Irish family, um, but that the Celtic thing wasn't just Britain, it was like Belgium and Germany. So that was nice, a nice link between Britain and where I was going to go for the exhibition. So I started looking at Celtic things. Like doing landscapes. Uh, because I like being outdoors, I like nature. So this is imaginary landscape. But that way, if I'm indoors, it allows me to kind of go out with, in my mind. Uh, sometimes on these canvases, I'll do a little trick that I first saw Mark Rothko do. Um, when I was sitting in a place where there was a Rothko and I was sitting on a couch down here, and I realized he'd painted around the edges of the pictures. So, I do that in case, like in this case, they don't get framed. So uh, 
I like the atmosphere of that picture. It just seems like a place I'd like to be. Uh, and here's that idea, the Rothko idea. This is the kind of canvas he, I saw it on, the gallery wrap, we call it. And as I say, he paints around the edges and underneath and on the top, just so that whatever angle you happen to be looking at the picture on, from, uh, there's still something there, doesn't just die in the corners, just wraps around. Uh, this again is like just me playing with the paint, but it's turned into kind of like a big landscape face uh, that a lot of people think is like Mount Rushmore. Uh, it's good fun physically doing a big picture like this because you, you get to sort of stretch and, you know, have a bit of a physical time with it that I like. And then all these pinks and browns and things, it's all me playing with the, the uh, colour of the earth, which just for some reason I seem to be fascinated with. The uh, thing I like about some, some of these big pictures is uh, I like sometimes building up a bit of paint. So I like these bits where there's a really great big dollop of this blue that I've been using. And of course you've got to wait a year at least for that to dry. So we're very patient with that and put it somewhere safe. But these, these, are this, these things just getting a nice big uh, surface on it. And one of the, I think one of the things I, I like playing around with the paints is the story kind of develops. So to me, this is a great big chrome robot. It's a giant in this valley. This is here. And, there. and then this is like a woman, blonde, looking at him. A scarf, bosoms, legs here, arm there. And I made up, as I was doing this, I just got a sort of fantasy that she's a character that comes and visits him, a bit like the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and he's in love with her. And I get a sort of big film story going in my head that helps me with the composition and stuff. But mainly, I think the thing I really enjoy about these things is when you get a little accident like this with the yellow and the blue. And it's something that if you paint it very precisely, I don't think these things happen. So. Yeah, in starting off and playing with the paints and stuff, I often do these back, this kind of lightish background, put some colours on it. And one of my alter egos is Mr. Blendini. And this kind of area here where I'm just, just having fun blending the colours, getting these colours to just blend perfectly into each other. I do enjoy that. Um, uh, the thing about some picture like this is knowing when to stop, because obviously you could put stuff in all these spaces. But uh, just, I, I reached a moment where I think it's finished. So get off, sign it, and then I know I can't go back to it. And there you have it, Arnolfini exhibition, my painting. Right, okay, here's my painting book. Very beautifully produced and handsomely printed by Bullfinch. There you go. The cover is a picture called Big Mountain Face. Uh, decided in the end that that would make the best cover. Most of these black and white pictures um, were taken by Linda, who used to just take pics when I was painting. This is just my stuff. These are some Polaroids of my horse Shadow. Um, just trying to do a horse in one of the pictures. Um, that's out in Arizona. And this is uh, a portrait Linda took of me with a painting called Red Abstract White Moon. This is a little picture I did. Um, just I was messing with this technique of putting masking tape on and then painting and then pulling the masking tape off to get these very clean little areas of canvas that uh, the paint hasn't touched. And I started in this middle area here, just doing like a road map of where I used to live in Liverpool. So these are my addresses. There's 72 there, which is 
Western Avenue. Uh, that's one of our old houses. It was a midwife's house. My mum being a midwife, we always used to live in the midwife's house. And the second one round there was 12 Ardwick Road. That's there. Just up from there is where George lived in a place called Upton Green. Then up here, this is very squashed, the scale of it, but over here was Allerton, third house we lived in in Liverpool. This was in Fourthland Road, which has now turned into a National Trust house. This is where John would live, up from Allerton, a place called Walton in Menlove Avenue. And then Ringo lived down this way, so this also gets the guys locations in. Uh, Ringo lived in Admiral Grove, John lived in Menlove Avenue. So that was just really a nostalgic little road map for me. It's going over all the places I used to go. It's a nice picture, a couple of pictures here Linda took of me and Bill de Koenig. That's his husky dog. These are the pictures he started doing um, <clears throat> towards the end of his career, which were very daring because he was known for dense, thick application of paint. And he suddenly started to clean the whole thing up. And there was a lot of white in them. And people were a little bit nervous. People would say to me, of all people, said, do you think they work? I said, well, I think they do. And I think they're very brave. It's very brave of someone to suddenly throw away what he's known for and very successful at. And I uh, saw so a recent exhibition where a lot of these pictures are tracings from some of the pictures he really liked. And then he traced it back and just used some of the bare lines in the composition. But they were nice pictures, those, and they're very highly thought of now. Another picture of me painting. This one was would have been a landscape and the trees I was just going to underpaint them in red and then as often I'm thinking I'm going to do is uh, finish them up and put the brown in and put all the little lines in and all that but I get to a stage where I suddenly think no I've got to stop this picture because I'll ruin it if I don't so often a lot of this under what would have was going to be underpainting ends up as the picture. And what happened here was a couple of little brush strokes of messing around with this white here. This is a landscape from my uh, window. We often get these hot air balloons coming over. There's a forest right over the back there. And this couple of little white brush strokes suddenly looked like Andy Warhol's hair. There's those white wigs he used to wear. So, and then a little face appeared. So it looked like him sitting in the garden. And I scratched back a little bit, but then I, I thought, no, I've got to stop it here. If I try and get any more detail, it suddenly won't look like him, I know. So I ended it there and just called it Andy in the Garden. This is a smallish picture that I painted of Linda, uh, called Yellow Linda with Piano. It started off, uh, it was late at night, and uh, I asked her if she wouldn't mind sitting for me. And uh, she never did mind, so she said, yeah, sure. And so she would just hold this pose uh, while I kind of did the painting. And uh, she had this blouse on with these fluffy shoulders, with a yellow blouse. And then with her blonde hair, uh, I, I thought, well, I should just continue this yellow. This chair wasn't yellow, really, and the piano's not yellow either. So, but I just kept that going so that the whole picture just became a very yellow picture. And like all the pictures I ever did of Linda, I think they all captured something of her. But none of them ever got kind of the definitive um, hair, because I think she was such a strong character, it's kind of difficult to just get the definitive picture. So, but this has a feel of her. And this yellowness um, sort of surrounds her. What I'd sometimes do is take things that are really happening, like these clouds were actually happening, these very strange clouds. This mountain range was there, uh, out west in Arizona. This was sort of the colour I was trying to get, but then I got fed up and decided that it'd be nice if this side was yellow. And these other things are taken from uh, Egyptian history. So this is an Egyptian symbol, I think, for a... Uh, Sunflower, or for corn, I'm not sure. Uh, this is a tree. Uh, and this is a big ibis. It's a male, I notice. 
and this little dog was sort of Egyptian too. And this at the bottom here, which actually was at the edge of a, a pottery, piece of pottery. If you imagine that, that's just the rim of a jar. But when I painted it in this strange scale, it looked like a railway platform, it looked like they were all waiting for a train. Um, and so I called it Egypt's, Egypt Station. A strange little man here with an even stranger jacket and his natty pinstripe trousers. This is more of the Celtic series. Again, I read this thing that really appealed to me that said Ovid had seen a group of people walking around this uh, Celtic uh, village. And because they prized eloquence so much, they had a little ring in the tongue of this man here, this old man who spoke so well, and attached to their ears, symbolically, by either an amber or a gold chain, um, <coughs> was another ring. So they were linking themselves symbolically with this man, and apparently they were walking, a group of them were walking around, sort of like a ritual to praise this man's eloquence. Well, I thought that was just the most far-out story I'd heard, which it seemed to me like body piercing, punk rock, and everything. And yet, it clued back into this ancient Celtic period. This one is uh, a little lake where I used to take my sailboat on. I used to start off here when I, uh, when I first learned to sail. Actually, my brother-in-law lent me his boat and I used to sail here. Come on out here. And then much later, in later years, Steven Spielberg bought a house just around there. Calvin Klein had a house there. So I used to feel like this little nutter sailing past their houses. Felt like shouting, hey, Calvin, give us a drink, man. And this picture is another one where accidents happened and I was on the way, I thought, to doing something really finished and never got there. Um, I will one of these days. But I was trying to do cloth garments and you see in so many of these old masters paintings where the folded cloths are expertly painted and the shadows are beautifully filled in. So I started off with this and I was going, okay, here, I thought I'll fill all this in. And then this little face appeared and it looked to me like John Lennon at the time when he had long hair. And I couldn't get away from the fact that that was like John had appeared in my picture. So I felt I had to leave the... I, I thought if I touched it, it suddenly wouldn't look like him. So I left, left the whole picture at this level of unfinishedness and then finished this kind of gown or something he's got as one of his little faces that John used to draw, these weird little creatures he used to have in his um, books. And then these faces all came. They were sort of trying to get off the edge of this frame. And something that reminds me of Tiepolo did that with some of his pictures. He'd be, he suddenly, he had this architect friend of his who would adapt the frame and give him a bit more frame so he could have a leg hang out of the painting. So I thought that was a great idea. So that became called John's Room. And I gave up on this idea of doing this clock. This, uh, my work table, these are the kind of things I'd pick up on a jog. An iced tea packet, I did a painting of that. Uh, just these little, that's a lottery ticket and stuff, a match book cover. But as I'm jogging, I think it's also a good excuse to stop jogging and doing this exercise of taking you through my painting book. Thank you very much. Good night. Step down. Next case. Breakfast with the Arts will continue in a moment with Paul McCartney paintings at the Arnolfini Gallery. Breakfast with the Arts continues now with Paul McCartney paintings at the Arnolfini Gallery. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Arnolfini. It's a very great pleasure to see so many of you here tonight. Tonight, in conversation with the artist Brian Clark, Paul will discuss his painting, which up until now has been a relatively private endeavour. It's my very great privilege to welcome Paul McCartney and Brian Clark. I'm in the fire one, yeah? You're on the fire. Well, well, 
We thought that we'd kind of deal with this as a really informal conversation between friends. So that there's, uh, I've got no questions in my mind that I'm going to ask Paul. I'm just going to wing it. But I think that way there's a possibility that it might be more interesting for you. So uh, I'll begin. <laughs> I'll begin by saying that, you know, the Arnolfini has a history, my personal history. About 25 years ago, I went to see an art dealer in the West End called Leslie Waddington. And I asked him what advice he would give me as a young artist about kind of having exhibitions and getting my work kind of seen around. And Leslie said to me, the best thing I can recommend you to do is to have an exhibition at the Arnolfini. And I think when Paul and I started chatting around the book launch and what's brought us here today, I could think of nowhere better than the Arnolfini for a variety of reasons, not least of which is that the Arnolfini stretches its aesthetic tentacles out across such a wide range of endeavours. All painters begin usually from the desire to just make something beautiful or to make something realistic or to make something that in some way seems like a reasonable replica of something in the visible world. Where do you start? What's, what starts when you start? And I, I'm not, and I don't mean just with This painting. is how all our conversations are. <laughs> yeah. I just listen to Brian. So what? But he missed it. But you see, it is true. Boy. It's exactly like all our conversations. He doesn't listen for the question. <laughs> there it is. What is it in, in music? Or in painting, what is it that triggers the act? Uh, for me, I just like it. I just like to do it. So it's really just, um, I just will fancy getting the paints out, getting the canvas out, and having a splash at the canvas. And then hopefully along the way, it turns into something a little bit more than that, you know, if it's successful. In a song, it might, I might suddenly get a decent idea halfway through. Or in a painting, the paint might kind of go in a certain direction and suddenly suggest to me where we should go today. But it's really only because I fancy doing it. You know, I'm not, I'm not really trying to turn anyone on but myself most of the time. And the idea of that random interference, as it were, it has also been a big part of your music, hasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't in the beginning. In the beginning, when I first started writing music, it was, um, well, i tell you the truth, it was to make money. You know, people forget that. We get into these arty discussions. We're like, you know, it was to get out of the poverty trap. You know, I was like the first one in my family with a car. So, um, and people don't really like to hear that. They say, no, you know, shh, shh. I don't say you did it for the money. But that is really the, the first thing. So all the songs kind of reflected that. You know, you're talking to your fans and you're saying, thank you, I love you, please buy this from me to you, love me do, <laughs> <laughs> buy this record, you know. Um, but, but if you're lucky, then this other thing takes over. And you, where you start with one motive, this other thing, this kind of magic thing starts to take over. That's kind of what happened um, in my career, in the, in the Beatles' career, where suddenly we had a bit of freedom, and it now wasn't quite so much about just making money. It now got to a better level, where magic things were starting to creep in. You go, ooh, I really love that moment when that happened. So you start to go after that. And that's when I think it gets exciting when you're going to say... And um, so the same thing with paintings, that little, little accident that'll happen when some paint drips or I'll see a face appear or something in the paint. Um, and then I just go after that then uh, and try and follow that magic. But during that period, that period going from poverty to celebrity, let's say, also had some other things going on in it. You became very close friends with Robert Fraser. So that must have had a big impact 
on the way you were thinking about art? Yeah, it was, as you say, first of all, Robert. I mean, we came down from Liverpool and now got a little bit of money and you'd be going to art galleries, so you'd maybe buy a little picture. I remember buying a little drawing by Jean Cocteau and just thinking, this is far out, you know, I, I just bought a Cocteau. This is really great. Um, then as time went by, you say, I got uh, introduced to Robert and we became really good friends. Because as you say, he was a fantastic um, art person, had a great ballsy take on everything. He's quite cheeky and uh, arrogant. In fact, my kids never liked him uh, till much later. They thought he was yeah. just too arrogant, you know. Yeah. I remember him once sort of saying, uh, 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 put, a, put a log on the fire. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> off. But um, he was a lovely guy and uh, just in sitting around and talking about what he was interested in, the kind of things I liked, I'd started to notice people like Magritte and I'd say, well, I, I really love what this guy does. And then he'd tell me that he'd been with Michael Cooper over to uh, meet Magritte and they'd photographed the, the, the bell push with R. Magritte on it, you know. And later, he took me over to uh, Paris to meet Iolas, his, his uh, gallery man. And we had a lovely little dinner, uh, sitting by this huge rhinoceros, the kind of thing that used to be in people's flats in those days. <laughs> and its side opened up and it was a cocktail cabinet. But, um, you know, so, <laughs> remember then? So, um, and then we'd go downstairs and the gallery would be closed, but there'd be all these Magritte's lying around, you know, and you could, it was like a treasure trove, you know. And he'd introduce me to people like Peter, Peter Blake, who's here this evening. And uh, so it was lovely just to talk to these people, uh, myself as a musician, them as painters or dealers or gallery people. Uh, and it was just an education for me. You know, I just, I love that. I love being turned on by people. I love people with knowledge in a field that I love. So it was a very rich experience, that. And yeah, in the 60s, there was so much of it happening. And I guess also it was the time when the arts actually dovetailed into each other mm. in an extraordinary way. Mm. And in a way, perhaps, that they don't really quite so much dovetail today. Mm. I, mean, I, th I, th I mean, if they're probably kind of rock historians in the audience, but... I think I'm probably right in saying that the Beatles were really the first group who embraced that beautiful word that Wolfgang loves, Gesamtkunstwerk, that, you know, music, painting, poetry, performance, it was all part of a single event. Yeah. And Robert, I suppose, in a way, was a kind of catalyst for all that. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And you'd, you'd go to shows, you know, of kinetic art where they'd, they'd have little bits of music in the art and it'd be ticking away and there'd be little cassettes playing. So they needed us. Some of, the, some of the artists actually needed us. And we needed them. Famous case being Peter with the Sergeant Pepper cover. Sure. Um, I'd be sitting around with this rough idea I had, chatting to Robert, and he'd sort of say, oh, Peter Blake, you should, you should get a fine artist to do this. Because traditionally, till then, we'd only ever... Um, we'd use very good people, but it'd mainly be a photographer and there wouldn't be much of a concept behind it. But I was trying to develop this thing where we'd break away from being just the Beatles. We'd finished touring and that was getting a bit crazy because we were losing our art there because we couldn't hear ourselves because of the huge success and the screaming. So that, we got a bit fed up with that. So in then hooking up with people like Robert, he'd say, you know, well, how about going and seeing Peter, you know? So then your projects would start to intermingle. And that was very exciting, you know, working with people like that. The Sgt. Pepper cover is probably the most famous album cover there's ever been. And there probably won't be a, a greater one now that album covers are that big. Mm. But as well as, you know, meeting somebody and interacting as, a, as an artistic colleague with somebody of Peter's stature, there were also other artists, weren't there? Seeing someone like uh, Willem de Kooning, he was a great fellow to be around because he was so casual about his, his work. And he was uh, an immigrant, as you know, into America. He stowed away uh, to get to America. 
got discovered by the captain, but the captain liked him. He was that kind of guy, he was so likeable. But he'd be, we'd be in his big studio out in uh, Springs, Long Island, and he'd be painting, and then he'd come and he'd sit down and he'd talk, and then he'd wander off and he'd paint. And so you'd, you'd be in these people's presence and just realizing the attitude was very different from what I thought it was with my kind of blinkered knowledge to that point. Uh, having been in music or having been to a grammar school where it was fairly structured. And I'd found that in music, I'd kind of been liberated. As things had gone on, you'd suddenly found this freedom. You thought, hey, you know, anything goes here. This is great. And the more you push your luck, the more chance there is of sort of finding something really exciting. Um, and so sitting around with uh, Bill de Kooning, he, he bore that fact out. You know, I once said to him, what is this picture, you know, about a big abstract he had. And he said, I don't know. He said, it looks like a couch, huh? And the, re the way he just said, it looks like a couch, and then said, huh, and offered it to me. I said, well, no, it looks like a purple mountain to me. And he said, mm-hmm, sure. I'm thinking, I don't believe this, you know. It means the content meant that little to him. It was more to do with the colors, the composition, in his case. And it, it really freed me up. I must say, I've still got the picture. And I, uh, I looked at it the other day, and I can see the couch. <laughs> Breakfast with the Arts will continue in a moment with Paul McCartney paintings at the Arnold Feeney Gallery. Breakfast with the Arts continues now with Paul McCartney paintings at the Arnold Feeney Gallery. It's a question that can't be avoided, this one, but the whole notion of celebrities who paint is a dodgy area, as yeah, you know. Very, yeah. And you know, from Tony Curtis to David Bowie to... Uh, Anthony Quinn. Anthony Quinn. Really, Anthony Quinn? Anthony Quinn. Anthony Quinn, there you go, Anthony Quinn. How do you deal with that? How do you feel about that? Well, really what I did was when I decided I was going to allow myself to paint, after that de Kooning remark, I just thought, right, well, I'm not going to get into that celebrity painter thing. So I thought, well, I just won't tell anyone. And I didn't for about 16 years. It's only my family actually knew I painted. Uh, and Linda took, um, she had photos taken and made a little book, which is a private book, not the one that we have mm -hmm. here. And just one or two friends I'd give that to. But basically that's how I solved it. It was like just being a closet painter. I just thought, well, I'm only doing it because I enjoy it. So I won't go outside that. But eventually, um, see, I know we talked about this before, I'd, I'd meet people, I'd go into a gallery and I'd just get chatting and I might let slip, you know, I, I do a bit of painting and the bloke would say, ah, oh, well I'll give you an exhibition. And I'd say, no, but you haven't seen the work. <laughs> it's, it doesn't matter. He said, it doesn't matter. And of course that blew it, you know, I'd go, well it does actually, you know, it, it's, that's, that's the central point. But the idea they would just give me an exhibition just because of who I was always put me off. And it was only when I met Wolfgang Suttner from Germany and he said to me, look, I really want to look at your stuff seriously. I don't want to get into this celebrity thing. I want to try and analyze it. I want to look at it. I want to get some serious people to look at it and try and do a show with it. That he finally persuaded me that uh, it wouldn't be such a bad idea to, to come out of the closet. Kind of thing. Do you have blank periods where you just can't work? You don't have any ideas? You know, I've got some ways around blocks. You know, I've got little alter ego people that help me through these dark moments. Um, you know, I think even a kid, when they're drawing, you'll sit down with a kid and they'll say, I'm going to draw something. And you say, right, what are you going to draw? They say, I don't know. And like, they'll they start off with a bummer. So you go, well, what about a house? No. Well, what about a doggy? No! And it's like it's angst-ridden from the word <laughs> go, you know. So I go, hell, I'm not going to get into that. I'm supposed to be, this is like an afternoon of enjoyment for me. So I have to find ways around that, because I don't paint for a living. So, uh, you know, so I have. I've found little alter egos. I've got certain people who help me out. There's a Mr. Blendini, who's very helpful. 
What does Mr. Blendini do? Blends. Ah. He likes to blend paint. <laughs> he likes colours to go into each other and blend. And so I could spend hours with him. I love him. And then uh, there's another friend of his who's called Luigi, who's, um, <laughs> who's a guy with a restaurant. <laughs> and in his restaurant, he's got an alcove. And he always wants a picture for the alcove. He's always said, Paul, you make a picture for my alcove. <laughs> so Luigi, I'll make one, I'll make one. So and it's all going horribly wrong. I go, oh, Jesus, what am I doing? I go, it's only for Luigi. It's for his alcove. <laughs> and he helps me over it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there are the domestically oriented pictures, the pictures that express a, a familial tenderness towards Linda, towards the kids, towards animals towards flowers, and there's the, the pervasive influence of the Celtic in a lot of the paintings. Mm. Talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, before I was saying, the way I was brought up as a sort of working class lad, um, you, you snigger at things, and it's good, you know, it's how people mm. are, you know, ooh, I wouldn't understand that being posh myself. Being posh and very yeah. sort of artistic, yeah. you wouldn't understand that. Um, because, because I uh, started off with this sort of sniggery attitude towards sex, nudes, and all that sort of thing, um, and quite glad of it too, you know, loved it. Nice bit of sexual repression, never hurt anyone. But because um, I started off like that, as I got more liberated through, as I say, um, meeting people, music, just as you, as you grow up, hopefully, you, you get a li little more liberated. Um, when I see primitive art, I love how unashamed they are of, you know, genitalia. So you'll often see these old statues with whacking great hard-ons. And you go, well, dear me. Or, you know, <laughs> you'll, you'll see these chalk <laughs> figures. And... I mean, you can't look, you can't say that it's dirty, because it's so many thousands of years ago. So that, again, was a freeing influence for me. So rather than just sort of thinking, well, I won't talk about that, I certainly won't put those in the pictures. Um, in, in those ones that uh, it was a little Celtic period, that all came because I was going to exhibit in Germany. And I realised that the Celts extended into Germany, Belgium and Britain. I kind of thought it was just the Irish and the, the, the Welsh, you know, that mm. was the Celtic thing. So I was um, pleased to see it extended further. Plus, I'm a Celt. You know, I've, I'm from Liverpool, Irish, and it traces back to the Celts. So it's kind of to do with my ancestry as well. You know, there are different kinds of pictures. There are as many kinds of artists as there are people. And some paintings deliver to us a kind of glimpse into an alternative reality that only they to have access to. Other paintings have a narrative. And quite a number of your paintings seem to have a story. I'm thinking of John's room, I'm thinking of Egypt Station, which is also here. Mm. How does that come about? How does that build up? By chance, really. I don't often, except for things like the Celtic thing, where I think, oh, that's such a nice story, I'll try and put it in the picture. Um, but it's normally by chance. To me, it reminds me of, when you look quickly at things, it's like the beginning of The Man from Uncle. You know that pam? <laughs> and it all goes abstract, but it's not. It's, it's lots of millions of things. It's, but it goes abstract. I think, I think our minds experience that every day. You, you're out the corner of your eye, you can see these lights, and you can see strange little things, images. That, but we're actually focusing on, you know, your body, this, this, this shape, because I have to, to keep my mind here. Yeah. But... Um, so often you just, I can see somebody's got one of these laminate passes and it's, it's flaring and it's just moving and stuff. And I, th I think in a way sometimes we remember those moments and they're kind of very special. I mean dreams for instance, you know, they're often to me as real as this. Mm. Every bit as real as this. And yet in some way you sort of discount them, you go, well no, they're just dreams. Like as if this is the reality and they're not. But they could be the reality. So, you know, it's like, I have to believe in that phenomenon because uh, it's played such an important part in my life. Um, you know, I say I woke up one morning and there's this tune, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
And I think if I hadn't have followed that up, obviously I wouldn't have written yesterday, I would have just gone, oh, it's a tune I just dreamed. But I've learned to sort of go to a piano and go, and grab it and try and record it. Record that moment, because it seems to me kind of valuable. And in that case, it obviously was literally valuable. Um, so I, I, I value that stuff a lot. I think more and more I value that. Are we being wound up? I think so. Should we go then? We should go. So uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, everyone for being here. In addition to his accomplishments as a musician and painter, Sir Paul McCartney was knighted by the Queen in 1996. Just last spring, he published Blackbird Singing, a wonderful collection of poems and lyrics dating from 1965 to 1999. The book, with more than 40 previously unpublished poems and over 50 of his legendary lyrics, brings new insight into the life and work of this beloved artist.